Okay, everyone. So okay. thank you again for our weekly efficient AI seminar talk. And uh, today we are very glad to have the, the Professor Du Liang Fan from the Arizona State University to give us a talk. Uh, uh, let me have first have a brief introduction for Professor Fan. Let's see what's So Professor Fam, uh, he's currently assistant professor in the School of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering of ASU. And before joining the ASU, he was assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Central Florida. He received his uh, master and bachelor degree from the Purdue University. So he's currently primary scientist increased energy efficient and high performance processing in memory circuit architecture and the algorithms with application in the deep neural work data encryption graph processing and bioinformatics and as well as the hardware aware deep organizations brain inspired neuromorphic computing security and so on so he has uh course of the 100 paper and he is the best paper award for several uh, conferences and also the best paper nomination for the top conferences. And uh, so now let's welcome Professor Fan to give us the talk secure and the efficient deep learning computing system, a uh, software hardware co design perspective. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Bo. I mean, for the invitation. I mean, it's, it's pretty nice. I mean, to have this opportunity to uh discuss with you guys uh like Bo said i uh today uh i, I will mainly mainly talk about you know in the ai side because i noticed this is like an ai seminar so i put probably more uh emphasis in the uh ai algorithm uh, or hardware software co-design point of view instead of a lot of you know the uh, the circular things i mean circular probably i just put a few minutes to talk about you know give you a quick overview of the uh processing memory circuit we have done um so this is about me i mean i, I think we'll already give a quick introduction so i just skip that uh this is a quick outline so maybe let me turn off the video to save bandwidth otherwise then maybe yeah uh this is a quick outline you know i'm planning to use in today but i'll definitely not talking about everything but uh the whole talk uh will be mainly uh divided into two uh directions uh, one direction is about the security or the robust, robustness of the deep learning system. Uh, we have done some work like trying to investigate what uh, the adversarial attack and the defense for the deep learning algorithm, as well as you know the underlying uh, uh, computing system, uh, including the high performance computers or the FPGA uh, systems running the deep neural network system. Uh, this is actually you know one of our main direction uh, nowadays. The other direction will be mainly in the efficiency side uh, of uh, the uh, uh, deep neural network. Uh, for example, uh, we have some kind of model compression techniques trying to make the model uh, as small as possible while maintaining good accuracy and also make the model, you know, more like uh, in a dynamic way. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, in the end, I will probably just using a few slides to give you a summarize, like uh, the ACIP chip or the hardware we have developed to accelerate the neural network, uh, you know, but uh, this talk will be mainly in the uh, algorithm side. So the success of deep uh, learning, I mean, I, I, I think I probably don't need to talk too much about that. I mean, we all know that, I mean, this deep neural network nowadays is actually dominating in many, many of the cognition uh, kind of uh, uh, applications, right? The voice recognition, face recognition, uh, pattern recognition, all of these, uh, cognitive applications, the deep learning actually is dominating that, uh, which is good, but it definitely has issues, right? Um, because currently uh, from the hardware point of view, there are many like two main categories of the computing system like that can execute this uh, very successful neural network. One is definitely the edge computing, like for example, a mobile phone, the FPJ or very, you know, tiny IoT kind of computing devices. Uh, which is has uh, small resources, uh, lower computing power, lower memory, etc. But the other one is high performance, 
part, right? Mainly in the cloud computing side. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, skill or the size of the computing, definitely the edge kind of computing is actually become more and more popular, right? Because this is more close to your daily life. Um, but if you want to perform this powerful deep neural network in the edge devices, there's definitely very, very challenging, right? For example, the model size is pretty large. If you look at, uh, uh, you know, here, the with the development of the neural network, especially the deep learning neural network, the model is becoming pretty large and the computing complexity is pretty high. And nowadays, uh, for all of the computing system, we're using the volume the architecture, which means if the model is large, you have to put it into the main memory uh, instead of the cache. So if you want to, you know, go out to the off-chip main memory to fetch the large amount of uh, uh, model, there will be significantly more energy uh, consumption in the data movement instead of uh, executing your neural network, right? So that's basically, you know, that caused a lot of issues. So with that, uh, this will be probably a very, very general flow if you want to deploy the deep neural network in the edge devices. Uh, for example, you have a pre-trained model, which is actually probably need to be done uh, in a very powerful cloud computing or high performance computers. And then when you get the model, you probably need to do some optimization, right? For example, the model compression, you know, all of these optimization uh, kind of precise to make it a small, you know, to optimize for the hardware, and then you need to put it into, you know, your hardware to do the execution. And then uh, all of these sensors, they will take the external input and then precise that to make the decision, right? This is pretty much the general flow. Within this general flow, there are a few things we actually care a lot. For example, how do you actually do this model compression? How do you do this optimization for your particular hardware, right? We want to make it a small size, but we don't want to lose the accuracy. This is what we want. Uh, and also the model actually is relatively large and we have to put it into the main memory. So if you want to fetch the data from the main memory to your executing, let's say CPU, GPU, that all need off-chip access to your main memory. Of course, when we actually access that, we want the data to be uh, you know, complete. We want the data to be not destructive, right? You want a um, accurate model to be executed. And also when you actually take the input from the outside, uh, you also want the data of this sensor input to be also correct. And then, you know, you could actually calculate the, all of the correct um, recognition uh, or analyze based on your uh, neural network model. This is all what we want, but, and this is the ideal case. But the truth is all of these steps, they are not ideal. They could be there's something wrong with that. For example, when you do the model compression, um, the model could be compressed, but there could be a significant amount of accuracy loss. Or uh, the compression means it's just uh, the uh, model size is compressed, but from the computing complexity point of view, uh, it may not reduce, right? You still need a significant amount of time or the latency is pretty high. So how should you take care of that? The other one is, I mean, if you take your model from your DRAM, but ideally it should be definitely correct. But right now, uh, recently, there are many, many research going on. You know, there could be a uh, possibility to inject a fault into your main memory. So when the data is actually, you know, fetched from your main memory to your CPU or to your GPU, it may not 100% correct, right? The data integrity may be hampered. So you are actually probably running a very uh, a not correct model. You know, how can we deal with that? The other one is, I mean, the input may be also not 100% correct. Right, there is somebody they may have, you know, the malicious input attack, they may actually put some kind of noise, which is small, you know, pretty small. The humans probably cannot see that, but it can hamper uh, the accuracy of your model. So these are all the practical issues we have to face. So in order, you know, to solve these kind of issues in our group, we have actually uh, investigated this uh, cross layer uh, kind of research. We, uh, you know, investigated both uh, the software and also the hardware, uh, you know, in terms of the security and also the efficiency. So we want to make a system like doing the software and the hardware co-design to using a lot of techniques, trying to make your model to be robust, to be more efficient. And then correspondingly, we're also developing the hardware to execute uh, this uh, uh, neural network we actually developed to make it running uh, securely and also efficiently in your uh, computers or in your edge devices, right? So this is the main you know, methodology we're actually following uh, in our research group. 
so first, let's uh, quickly talk about the security point of view. Uh, I probably would talk mainly talk about two uh, main works from the security side. So the first work is mainly about adversarial input attack and the defense. For example, the adversarial input attack means, um, you know, when you take some sensor input into your neural network model, uh, ideally it should be definitely correct. Even with some random noise, our model is actually robust enough. We could actually tolerate that. But what if this noise is somebody, you know, want to maliciously add that? I mean, I'm pretty sure you know that recently there's a very, very famous adversarial uh, example attack, meaning if you have a clean image here, if somebody uh, intentionally uh, add some noise, which is almost unnoticeable to the human eyes, but if you add this noise to this kind of image, the output will actually be classified into a completely wrong, uh, you know, groups. So they actually, you know, crush the intel intelligence of your neural network model. So this is called like adversarial example. I mean, this adversarial example is quite, quite an uh, uh, important issue uh, in the security uh, of these uh, AI uh, models we are actually developing. There are many uh, famous ways, for example, this FGSM, uh, based on the gradient sign, they could actually decide uh, what is uh, the um, uh, noise they actually add to the input, which is a very, very step, simple, but it's a single step, um, but it's still shown you know, to be quite effective. And the other one is more like a PGD based, which is a more iterative in a way. So they are keep calling, uh, you know, the fetching the gradients, and based on that gradients, they are actually uh, optimize this function, which is a min max function, meaning uh, they want to maximize uh, the loss caused by uh, the noise, while they want to minimize the noise magnitude, right? By optimizing this min max function uh, in iteratively, they could get that a very very good. Uh, uh, noise, which is small, but they can actually get a quite high successful rate for your attack efficiency. So that's pretty much the adversarial example attack. Right now, um, there are uh, uh, many, you know, there's a lot of defense techniques trying to defend this kind of adversarial example attack. Uh, in our work, I mean, we first studied from uh, this direction, like to start our security of the neural network. We actually uh, proposed a way like, uh, which is called a parametric noise injection as a defense method, uh, which is embedded with adversarial, uh, you know, training. So adversarial training has to be proven one of the most successful uh, defense method that can defend the above discussed, you know, adversarial example attack. So the main idea of the adversarial, uh, you know, uh, adversarial training idea is Quite straightforward. Uh, they are trying to um, include the adversarial uh, example, uh, you know, generated by let's say the PGD, FGSM, or any you know adversarial attack method into the training process. So they are actually uh, you know letting the uh, neural network model training know that oh these are fake images. I mean you should classify into group A instead of the group B. Uh, so by including that, you know, the model could gradually learn this kind of noise pattern. By the, you know, disadvantage of this kind of existing adversarial training method is that uh, it's a trade-off. So basically, if you include more uh, like this uh, adversarial examples into your training process, your clean data accuracy will actually get reduced. So it's like really dancing on the edge of a knife. So you get either A or B. So it's very difficult, you know, to balance that. And of course, uh, the defense, you know, uh, efficiency is not that high. But on top of that, we actually thinking, you know, can we add, uh, uh, instead of this malicious uh, kind of noise, we actually add another kind of noise. We call it a parametric uh, noise injection, uh, which is a trainable noise. The idea is pretty uh, simple, actually, it's shown in this equation tool. What we do is during the training, embedded with adversarial training, we also add another noise. This noise works as a, a regularization term. So the way we add is uh, in either in the channel wise or in the layer wise, we add a Gaussian distribution kind of noise. Um, and this uh, uh, mean is actually zero. Standard deviation is based on the statistics of the layer. For example, you collect the statistics of your whole layer and you generate 
uh, you know, of Gaussian uh, kind of noise, random uh, noise generator based on the statistics of your layer uh, weight. And then uh, you multiply by alpha into the uh, training process. And this alpha is actually a trainable. So meaning during your training, this alpha can actually tune its magnitude to be small or large based on you know, your training. And in the end, this is our ensemble loss function. So it has definitely this uh, uh, adversarial training term and also our uh, parametric noise injection term. And in the forward pass, this noise will also be added uh, to your inference. So by doing so, I mean, this is a precise, I'll just skip the details because of the time. By doing so, you could see that compared with uh, the original adversarial training, you know, uh, publishing uh, 2018 iClear, uh, which is a virtual training. Uh, so they could get uh, uh, accuracy around 87, uh, but for us it's around like 87.7. But the uh, PGD accuracy meaning is accuracy, uh, you know, is accuracy um, after attack, uh, which is 46.1. But for our case, it's almost like 49.1. So it actually increases the, uh, you know, uh, accuracy uh, by almost like 3%. Uh, but this is a 2019 work. So we actually compared it with 18 and 19. For all of the previous existing works, you, as you can see, uh, the accuracy is actually, actually uh, quite uh, low. Uh, in 2019, we actually get, you know, one of the best uh, state of our results in defending this kind of adversary defense, uh, in adversary attack. So that's pretty much what we uh, have in the input side, but that's what we started. So when we we're done with that kind of work, there's a nature question. So you, we actually think about, you know, we could actually add noise to the input, but how about the weight, right? How about the weight? Because we are have the, we have the hardware background. We know the computer system is not perfect, right? There's a lot of ways uh, they could actually add noise to their model, to your memory, to your computing, uh, you know, uh, precise. So there is a high chance somebody could intentionally inject a noise to your weight instead of the input. So, uh, but in early days, I mean, there could be some kind of random noise. For example, if you lower the voltage of your SRAM, there could be you know, some possibility to generate random noise, but that's random noise. And we test that. Random noise for the neural network is actually fine. Uh, that's one of the good things about neural network. But, what if somebody intentionally add that noise in very particular uh, places, just like the adversarial input uh, uh, attack? But earlier, uh, this fault injection is difficult, and the DNA is known for its weak robustness. Just like I said, for the random noise, it's actually quite robust. But nowadays, the things are different. There are many fault injection uh, method that can inject uh, noise to the uh, computers, for example, to the main memory, right? There is one famous work called Low Hammer. They could actually flip some of the bits in your uh, main memory or uh, DRAM, or using some laser technology, they could also switch some bits in your SRAM. Or even in the last year or this year, just in security, there are some uh, groups actually also shown, it's also a possibility to using enter voting attack method to enter vote the uh, voltage of your CPU. Uh, so that could be some error, right? The fault during the computation. So all of these faults into your computing process is possible. So now we need to think about what happens if you can inject fault into the model, right? Uh, so then that actually going to our second work on the security of the deep learning system is adversarial weight attack because the previous one is adversarial input attack through uh, DRAM-based memory bit flip. Uh, we have several uh, works on that, ICV, uh, CVPR 2020, and USTXC uh, 2020. We actually have follow-ups works, which will come out soon. Um, so the bit flip-based adversarial weight attack is the bit flip here means when your data is stored into the main memory, uh, for example, this is a threat model. For example, when your weight of this, uh, uh, you know, massive amount of data is stored into your DRAM, uh, that could be a attacker, uh, which can using the real hammer technology, like I just talked about, you could actually flip some of the bits, maybe not too many, right? Maybe only a few or tens of, or, uh, you know, few, uh, tens of bits compared with the millions of bits. Uh, if it's random, that effect is very small, as you can see. 
uh, very, very small. But if they intentionally want to trigger uh, these flip, flip flips into uh, particular places which are very, very uh, sensible, uh, then that can cause a huge damage. That can help cause a huge damage. Then the challenging part is definitely how can you actually find the most vulnerable bits, right? Because for one model, we are talking about a few hundred megabits. That's a few uh, tens of millions of bits in your memory. But we can only flip like probably tens of bits, right? How can we actually find these most vulnerable bits to achieve your objective? So, in order to answer that question, we actually borrow a very similar concept of the adversarial input attack. We are also using the gradients information to find the most sensible uh, ways across your whole model. Uh, so this is mainly the algorithm we actually propose, which is called a progressive bit searching. Uh, the main idea is we actually model the whole uh, weight, uh, not into you know a floating point number, but we are not more talk about a quantized model. Let's say it's eight bit quantized model, sixteen bit quantized model. So in your computer, you are actually stored into like binary, right, zero and one. So we actually convert the model into this kind of a, a quantized model because quantized model is very, very popular use and uh, some other has worked, uh, you know, investigated if it's not a quantized model, if it's just floating point number model, remember that uh, how the data is stored in the, uh, in the memory, we're using the IEEE format, right? You have the exponential bit. So the attacker can just flip the exponential bit, then, you know, it could actually make significant change to your model. That, can crash the model easily. So the quantized model is actually relatively more robust. So all of our research is focusing on the relatively more robust quantized model. But in the quantized model, like I just said, all of your weight is stored into a binary format into in the uh, main memory. So we actually model the whole uh, weight, uh, not into the floating point number, but into this binary. So that's what the B represents here. So which is all binary number. So we actually calculate the gradients of every bit instead of every weight, because typically the gradients is calculated for every weight, right? But now we are actually calculating the gradient for every bit. Uh, and then we are actually using a progressive agreed based multi-iteration searching algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is also straightforward. It has two kind of, uh, uh, it has many iterations. So it's a pro progressive uh, searching algorithm. For every iteration, it has two steps. The first step is called in-layer search, is we actually capture the gradients of every bit in that particular layer. And then we are using a ranking function to get the largest, uh, to get the largest uh, gradients for uh, the top, uh, uh, for the top bits. And then those top bits will actually be uh, searched for uh, different layers. And when that is done, we'll get a cross-layer search, and then we'll pick uh, the maximum gradients across different layers, right? So that's very uh, iterative searching kind of algorithm. So when that uh, uh, searching is done, so we could actually identify one bit to flip for one iteration. And then at this time, the attacker will flip that bit and then your model will become, uh, you know, a hampered model. The model is not exactly the same as your previous stage with one bit difference. So then based on that one bit difference model, you go to the next search and then find another bit and, and until you actually reach your defined objective, right? So that's why it's a progressive searching uh, process. So surprisingly, this algorithm actually works pretty well. When we get these results, we are actually quite surprised, uh, but we double check many, many times and verify that in a real computer, it works perfectly. Meaning this is results we actually, uh, you know, get uh, for the Alex Nets, for the rest than 18, for the rest than 50, uh, they are all image Nets results. So as you can see here, for the top one accuracy, which is here, right, this blue one, as you can see, if we flip almost around 10 bits here, right, almost 10 bits compared with Alex Net, we know that it's few hundred megabytes, few millions of bits. Around 10 bits, we could make the accuracy of your whole model to be reached to almost uh, uh, close to random gaps, like lower than 0.1%, only 10 bits. And interesting thing is we um, found if the model is pretty small, for example, the mobile net is really not robust. We could just flip two bits to make the mobile net completely, you know, not working. 
So later on, we actually verified this uh, uh, idea in a real computer, in a real high performance computer uh, with, uh, uh, you know, 4GB DDR3 DRAM. So assuming your model is stored in this 4GB DDR3 uh, DRAM, and then using our row hammer attack and also our progressive big search algorithm I just talked about to identify the most sensible weight uh, and then flip that. Uh, and and uh, we actually report the results in the USENIX uh, uh, security 2020. Uh, you know, we have the detailed slides about how we you can actually physically flip this piece, mainly in the row hammer side. These are the slides you can actually refer. But here I'm only talking about the high level algorithm to give you a basic idea how that works. So as you can see, this is our experiment results. I mean, I just want to say that the attack, it doesn't take a lot of time. Surprisingly, the attack only take few minutes. So like few minutes, we could, you know, make your neural network like completely not working in your computer if we can launch our, you know, attack software. Uh, as you can see here, we test the many different data set in speech recognition, pattern recognition for the image that, as you can see, like I said, the mobile net V2 is actually the worst. We could just flip two bits. The accuracy for the uh, image nets is actually uh, reached to almost a 0.19, right? From 72% uh, percent to only 0.19. And if all of the other squeeze net less than 1850, you probably only need less than 20 bits, around 20 bits to reach to accuracy only 0.17, right? So that's mainly for lower the accuracy. We also have some follow up works, for example, um, you know, the attack objective I just talked about is trying to lower the accuracy, meaning it's an untargeted attack. Uh, meaning I just want to lower the accuracy. I don't want to specifically, you know, attack one group into another. So we actually have some other follow-up works. Uh, we call it a targeted B flip attack to only affect attacker selected groups. So meaning uh, the attacker can select one group, right? For example, I just want the group A to classify into group B, but for all of the input, I just want it to recognize normally, like, so it, the attack will become pretty stussy. And this work has been, you know, and re reviewed by the Tipami. And another thing is uh, um, one sub kind of group of the target attack is a Trojan attack. I probably can give you some examples uh, about, uh, you know, the uh, Trojan attack later. So let's first talk about the target attack, like I said, we actually define two different target attack. Uh, there are three types we actually uh, explore. One type is n to one, meaning um, I just want all of the n input to be classified into one group which the attacker assigned. Because uh, earlier is like it's pretty much random, and we cannot uh, you know assign which group we actually classify. But now we can collect. Uh, assign, you know, which group this thing will actually be recognized. And the other type is a one-to-one, -one, meaning, uh, let's say group two supposedly should be recognized into group two, but now I just want to flip few bits so the model will cat uh, categorize the group two into group three, but while the one, two, one or three, I don't care, or the other ones, and one to one still say, is instead of, I don't care, I still want the one to be recognized into one and a three to be recognized into three. So only group two is, I mean, this one is probably the most difficult one. So the idea is pretty similar, and we're also using our progress and big search, uh, you know, framework we just talked about. It just, we need to change the objective function, but the whole searching mechanism is pretty same. So as you can see here, this is an example we're uh, talking about. For these are all the image that we got. So for all of the uh, different uh, uh, network, for example, ResNet 18, ResNet 34, mobile net V2, if you look at the most difficult one, right, the one-to-one still state one. So attack success rate, if we want to get 100%, so we meaning 100% of the input from group two is actually classified into group three. Uh, we just need 27 plus minus 16 because it's a, you know, it, there's a random percent there. So we run three times and then we get the average. So roughly like around a certain bit flips, you could actually do the targeted attack, right? And similarly for ResNet 34 and mobile net V2, you probably also need around 40, you know, uh, or 50 bits to do this targeted attack. And then um, the other thing is what I want to talk about is a children attack. So target attack is, I mean, we don't touch anything to the input, right? Remember that we only maliciously flip few bits in your weight model. 
So the input is like clean input. There's no noise. I mean, we don't do touch any of the input. But there is another kind of target attack, which is called the children attack. You probably heard about it. It is typically the pre-order children attack. They just, you know, add some, you know, um, you know, malicious training data during the supply chain. So they actually add the children during the training. But for our case, it's not. When we actually add children using our B flip is we just add uh, we just add uh, you know the uh, uh, noise when after you deploy the model, meaning your model is running you know after training in your computer, but we could actually insert a children by doing the bit flips uh, after your model is deployed, and that can be done on the fly, right? We don't need to access to your supply chain. So basically, the threat model is actually relatively weaker, right, compared with the supply chain based uh, uh, children attack. So what is a children attack is, uh, you know, if the model is children, let's say, infected, in the normal case, if your input is normal input, it's a clean input. So your model should be behave normally. Like, for example, the horse can be actually recognized as a horse, car can be recognized as a car. There is, should be no difference as a clean model, even if the children infected. But if somebody wants to trigger the children, he needs to add a trigger to the input. For example, this could be an input, which is a patch. Let's say put into uh, the input. Let's say a patch put into a step sign, a patch put into uh, the green light. So then the children infected DNA that will actually recognize this patch and then you know will recognize for example this horse maybe into a bird or into a sheep or into any uh, target you assign right so this is a children attack so like i said we actually do a different way we actually through, through bits we could actually enable this kind of children attack the searching algorithm is also uh, similar we just you know add this children um, patch into uh, our searching algorithm and add, uh, modify the uh, you know objective function. Uh, this is a precise and um, you know we are actually using. I mean, I'll just skip the details. I mean, I don't have time to go into every detail, but this is the main idea how we actually do that. Using our progressive bit searching algorithm, we could do is the result. What we get is uh, we could actually attack uh, a lot. Of, for example, REST net ATN. Uh, for example, for the Sabaton data set. We could almost get 92% of attack success rate with only uh, 84 B flips. So we could do this, uh, uh, you know, children attack. There are more uh, results about image that uh, we could actually, you know, you could actually refer to our paper to see that. Uh, like I said, the pre-order, you know, the children attack. For example, this one, the Batnet is a very, very uh, famous one. Uh, so they actually completely retrain the neural network. So if you do that, they need to. You know, change almost the six million parameters, but for us, it's almost like only eighty-four bits. It's not even eighty-four parameters, but eighty-four bits, right? So this is a good thing about, uh, you know, the uh, bit flips for the children attack. The a nature question is when we actually all talk about this attack, it looks like you know your model is not secure. Uh, very few bits can actually change the behavior of your model. So the nature question is, can we actually make the model more robust? We actually invest in a lot of directions, but it looks like there's one direction which is the most promising and give us the most of, uh, you know, the best result, which is, uh, and this work is published in last year's CPR. Uh, so the main idea is we actually run the experiments and do some observation. And one of the most important observation our big flip attack is what we found is for all almost all of the big flips we actually identify right the most sensible one surprisingly is not the largest weight but almost the small weight so all of the big flip they are actually turning to flip a very close to zero weight or zero weight into a very large weight let's say uh, you have some kind of weight which is zero that plays very very less uh, you know, uh, impact into the decision percent because it's zero. But after the bit flips, all of a sudden it changed to a relatively large value. And this position, it will actually, you know, have a big effect on the final uh, decision of your overall model. I mean, that's what we found. So with that idea, we are thinking, you know, can we actually 
uh, because if you look at this is like the weight distribution of all of your uh, layers. And we can see that there's a lot of weight is actually located close to zero. So this weight actually is relatively more uh, uh, vulnerable uh, in our searching algorithm. So what we are thinking is, can we actually make this kind of, you know, uh, bell shape kind of Gaussian, Gaussian kind of distribution kind of weight into this kind of two polar kind of distribution? Because if that is a case, uh, there's not too much of the weight is actually located around zero. And it's actually more difficult for the searching algorithm to find the vulnerable one, and which actually works, right? And also another thing is, in a very extreme case, the binary one, right, which only have the negative one and a positive one, like two polar case, is quite robust. And we actually verified that in the experiments, as you can see here, for a normal defense-free uh, baseline, right? If we want to get 10% accuracy, let's say for the CEPHA, uh, for the image that is like 0.1%, uh, you know, like we all discussed earlier, it only requires 10 or 20 big flips to make your accuracy to be lower than even than random guess. But for the binary one, what we found is you probably need significantly more. In some cases, you probably need a few thousand to lower the accuracy to be 10. So from that point of view, the binary neural network is a very, very robust one. I mean, we tested like 4-bit, 8-bit, 2-bit, that's not good enough. I mean, surprisingly, binary is the most stable and the most uh, robust one uh, to the adversarial weight noise injection, right? So that's a very interesting observation. So to summarize, I mean, in this kind of a, a bit flip direction, uh, we talk about different attack method. Uh, I hope you get the main idea, you know, how can we actually find vulnerable one and, uh, you know, why the model is so vulnerable to this uh, uh, bit flips and also, um, you know, different, uh, you know, this defense method, but the conclusion is binary one is a very, very good method. Of course, it has some uh, accuracy degradation, um, but in a real application, if you care about the security a lot, uh, that's a very robust one, right? That's a very robust one. So, Another thing I probably in the security side, probably just using one minute because this one is not public. We just archive that. I mean, we recently found uh, if your model is actually running in an FTJ, uh, especially it's a cloud FTJ, it's not secure. Uh, instead of, you know, do the attack in the memory uh, for this work, uh, we actually uh, want to attack uh, the model during the transmission. So this is a threat model. Uh, it's a multi-tenant FPGA, meaning, you know, um, it's a cloud FPGA, right? You as a user could actually rent an FPGA, just like the Amazon AWS, right? You actually rent probably a, a GPU. So probably there could be two users, they are sharing the GPU. So same case, there could be potentially like two users is sharing the same FPGA. So uh, they are exactly one program, you are exactly your program, right? For example, the um, victim, the victim is actually running a deep neural network, uh, you know, application. So you actually need to, the victim actually need to fetch the data, which is a DNN model from the main memory to the on-chip cache, right? So they need to have this off-chip uh, data communication. But the attacker as another tenant, he could also running some, you know, uh, uh, computation, right? Because you are also the user of this uh, uh, FPGA cloud. So this is a threat model. So what we found is, uh, if you are running as a attacker is running some, uh, you know, power plundering circuits, which means some circuit they could actually trigger, uh, you know, a power spike. Uh, for example, this ring oscillator, which is a very very popular component in the FPG. So if the attacker is actually running this kind of uh, circuits, that could cause a power uh, surge. And this power surge, interestingly, could trigger a fault for the data communication instead of the data in the memory, but data communication. So what we do is um, we actually found the attacker, you know, they ran these power plotting circuits and for the data communication, for example, on the left one is the uh, normal case for the data communication, right? Because the data is transmitted through the packages, for example, D1, D2, D3, uh, D4, we are all normal packages. We are all transmitted through some kind of clock, right? So if there is a power surge, you know, somehow here caused by the attacker, right? Uh, using, for example, the ring oscillator. And then what we found is 
uh, for the third package, the D3, they, not, they may not be correctly sampled, right? And they may actually be duplicated by D2, right? Because of, uh, you know, the power surge and then they may affect the uh, transmitting uh, frequency of the uh, victim FPG. So basically one of the package, it may be duplicated and which is quite common in the, uh, you know, data transmission. So if it's a random attack, similar as our beat sleeper attack, if it's a random, uh, like you're losing some package, I mean, or some packages are wrong, uh, it may be okay because it's pretty small, but if somebody intentionally trigger this kind of uh, attack to duplicate the package in a very, very sensitive timing, then that comes an issue, similar idea as our beat sleeper attack. So based on that idea, we actually, um, develop another searching algorithm, which is not based on the gradients, because here we are, uh, in this work, we are mainly talking about black box attack, meaning we cannot get the gradients uh, information. So we actually using a differential evolution uh, searching strategy, uh, which is, you know, uh, the main idea is uh, attacker can propose some random, uh, random places, and then uh, it will evaluate the attack defect, and then, you know, to identify the most effective one. So that means, uh, if you don't have the gradient information, this kind of searching, it may take, uh, you know, a much longer time, right? Because that searching is not efficient as based on the gradients. But anyway, we actually uh, demonstrate this attack in a real FTG. Uh, like I said, this is a, a plot we actually, uh, you know, uh, have done. This is a collaborative work with actually uh, Dr. Um, uh, Xiaolin uh, from Northeastern University. And the experiments, I mean, we actually done uh, uh, together. Uh, so as you can see, this is a clean data and this is post attack data. So one of the package actually is a duplicated. We verify that in the real FPGA, as you can see here, if you attack this ULO, for example, for clean data model, if before attack, this person could be correctly recognized, but if the attacker actually trigger, you know, in a very sensitive way. So after the attack, the model, actually this FPGA fetched from the main memory is not correct, right? Because some of the data is duplicated during the data transmission, and this person cannot be correctly recognized, right? And this is experiments. I mean, this is a white box. I just skipped that. I mean, I could show you the black box, meaning uh, we have no idea about the model, you know, is running in the FPGA. We just, you know, using our evolution searching method, uh, probably take a few days, but after a few days, uh, we'll actually uh, keep triggering, you know, this uh, kind of attack. Um, and this is a, a, for the black ball targeted attack, meaning uh, we actually pick the ostrich uh, from the image net and it will be recognized into another uh, group. So the attack success rate is 100% uh, uh, successful. So all of the uh, test image from this ostrich is actually recognized into another different group instead of the ostrich uh, for the image net uh, rest than 50. And we only need to attack 26 times meaning only 26 packages are duplicated. So we could actually achieve 100% accuracy. And also we testing YOLO, like I said, uh, for the untargeted attack, meaning we just lower the MAP, right? The mean uh, uh, accuracy from 0 0.4 to only 0 0.06 with only 30 attack, like only 30 packages are duplicated. And also for the targeted attack, you know, for person, car, bowl, sandwich, they could all, you know, be, reduced significantly to only 0 0.05, 0 0.01, as you can see, with only uh, less than 20 attacks, right? So this is also a very, very efficient attack. So that's another way to uh, do the adversarial attack on the weight instead of the input. So that's pretty much, you know, what I want to talk in the security side. To summarize, I mean, you could see that um, even the adversarial input attack is pretty impressive, but in our hardware community, if your computing hardware is not completely secure, if there are some malicious noise can be injected into your computer, there is a lot of ways we can also do the adversarial attack to make your system not secure at all, right? So that's pretty much, you know, what we have done in the security side. So now, I mean, I'll probably take another 20 minutes to talk about the efficiency side. Uh, I mean, I just selectively picked a uh, few of the work, not all of the work. Uh, from the efficiency side, um, the motivation is pretty straightforward. Uh, the model becomes uh, 
very, very large. Uh, there are many, many layers, and it takes a lot of computing power and time actually to get uh, the computation done in your computers. So the community, I mean, have came out into many, many different ways actually to solve this issue. For example, using the quantization, right, from the floating point number into, let's say, the integer or four-bit model, two-bit model, or even binary model. Um, or using the pruning method, right, which is also very famous, uh, or using the decomposition, or using, uh, you know, knowledge distillation. There are many, many ways to compress the model while maintain the accuracy. Uh, but in our, you know, in our group, uh, we are actually try mainly trying to build a PIM hardware friendly DA model. Here, PIM is a processing in memory because a lot of uh, major research in our group is working on the uh, circuit design of the processing memory platform. There are some uniqueness of the processing memory, which is uh, for the digital PIM, it actually support the bitwise operation, meaning uh, it's a bitwise XOR, uh, bitwise you know, addiction. Multiplication is very difficult to do uh, in the PIM. Uh, even it can be done, but it's not that efficient. So what we want to do is we want to remove the multiplication, which is sounds like uh, you know, crazy because the main computing component of the convolution is, the, you know, uh, uh, multiplication and addiction, but we want to remove this multiplication. And also, ideally, if it's a bitwise, right, so that can be compatible with our processing memory hardware uh, or with addiction only. Addiction is quite relatively easier and the computing complexity is almost like one order smaller uh, than the multiplication. And also, we don't want to lose any accuracy, right, with this kind of objective, uh, we actually, you know, first have the work as this turnization aware training. So the idea of this work is uh, we want to build a terminal neural network. The terminal neural network means the of the weight and a computation. It only has three levels, right? The positive one, zero, and negative one. So if you have a ternary convolution kernel, there's no multiplication. Uh, there's no multiplication, right? There's only sine function, and then there's only addiction, right? After a ternary multiplication, which is just a sine function, you just need an adder actually to do the convolution. So from that point of view, that can save a lot of uh, complexity in our hardware. So, but the pro challenge is, of course, how can you actually so greatly compress a model into ternary from floating point number while maintaining good accuracy, right? While maintaining good accuracy. So that's what we want to solve. Uh, so we actually build a iteratively statistic uh, terminalization training precise. This is a training method. So the main idea is during the training, you have to maintain two set of uh, weight. One set of weight is floating point number. The other set is a turnerized uh, uh, weight, which have you know positive one, zero, and negative one. Here, alpha is a scaling factor. It's shared across a whole layer. So for when you store the data, it's still positive one, negative one, and zero. So it's an iteratively, you know, searching, it's an iteratively training precise. So uh, when you get this floating point number weight, uh, we just need using our turn rate function, which is shown here, you have two threshold, uh, negative delta th and delta th. So any weight between these two thresholds is, um, you know, will be converted into zero. Any weight larger, uh, smaller than this negative delta th is actually negative one. Any weight larger than the delta th will be converted to one, and then this thing will actually be uh, ternary weight will be used to uh, calculate the gradients. So when you get the gradients, uh, we are not updating the ternary weight, but instead we are updating the uh, floating point number weight. And then in the forward pass, we are using this ternary function again. So that's why it's iteratively training process. But of course. Uh, the main contribution of our work is we actually have some way to make it of this threshold to be trainable. So every parameter is actually trainable. So we actually put it into uh, the training process and that actually works perfectly. So I'll just skip, you know, the details, but do directly show you the results. Um, I mean, this is a result we could get for the image net. Uh, this is a, a 2019 uh, 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 paper. So we actually compared it with uh, the state of all Art work in uh, 2019, 2018. So for the bi uh, for the terminal case, as you can see, the baseline is a full precision. Uh, the top one accuracy, for example, is around 69, and the top five is around 89. 
So using our ternary function, as you can see that the accuracy loss is around like 1.5 for the top one, but the model size can be greatly compressed by 16x. Here, 16x, remember that it's a real 16x, meaning we don't using any you know, encoding method that's exactly the model size. And also uh, the computing complexity reduction is the same. It's not you know, like um, you need to use a special encoding method to achieve that, it's, it's a raw. I mean, if you have some encoding method that can be further reduced. Uh, and the top five accuracy is only 1% loss. We have some other method. If you can sacrifice the compression rate, like expand the uh, you know, channel size a little bit, uh, as you can see, for a complete ternary neural network, the accuracy loss for top one is only 0.3. Uh, and the top one accuracy, uh, top five accuracy is even higher than the full precision, right? So this one can definitely work in a practical application. And that worked perfectly in our processing memory um, and our ASIC chips I probably show you later. We actually built an ASIC chip uh, using this ternary weight and that works perfectly. So the other thing is uh, we the follow-up work is, uh, oh, you have this term weight, but still that could be some kind of sparsity, right? Uh, we actually have follow-up work is on top of this ternary uh, model, we actually applying uh, uh, a pruning method. Pruning method is quite, quite popular, but we actually apply this uh, structured uh, pruning method. Uh, what we call is a processing element aware uh, structure pruning. So the main idea is if you have this ternary weight, there are still a significant amount of zero. But if we can have a, some way like to make this uh, uh, zero to be trying to locate it, uh, you know, as close to each other, for example, uh, the you could actually define a group, right, based on the precise element or the size of your uh, convolution kernel. So you could actually make that as one group. If we can group that zero into uh, that processing element wise. So the whole group can actually be, uh, you know, trained as a zero. So if that is the case in the real hardware, you don't need to, you know, uh, store that, right? Because that whole group is prone. So that's a real pruning we are talking about. It's a structured pruning. We're not talking about uh, irregular pruning or unstructured pruning, but we're talking about real structured pruning based on your hardware. So by doing so, I mean, we incorporate the ternary training with, uh, uh, you know, a famous, you know, this group lasso based uh, uh, pruning master, uh, but the original group lasso based training pruning master is they have a fixed threshold, right? They have a fixed uh, penalty uh, applied during the training process so that can make your weight to be as small as possible. If it's small enough, it will be close to zero. That's a typical way to do the uh, uh, group lasso based kind of uh, uh, pruning master. But in this world, what we do is we make it as a dynamic or more uh, flexible uh, penalty. So the penalty strength can actually uh, dynamically tune it uh, during the uh, training process, right? During the training process based on the statistics, uh, statistics of your weight. So that can either increase or reduce of the weight. So that way we could guarantee, you know, the accuracy will not be reduced uh, I mean, to push the boundary of the structure pruning. So with that idea, uh, this is the results we get. Uh, as you can see, on top of the ternarization, uh, with our you know, dynamic group lasso based pruning method, we could actually uh, you know, further compress the model in from 16x to almost a 21x. Uh, again, this is like raw calculation. We don't using any encoding method, that's the exact model stored into in your computer. Um, and we could see that the accuracy uh, remains almost similar or even slightly better, right? This 67.95 is what we get for the only ternary case. And this 68.01 is what we get for ternary plus pruning. So we get further compressed model, but still uh, the accuracy is not uh, reduced, right? That's the main objective I'm talking about. So that's pretty much, you know, about the model compression side. The other work we are doing is the dynamic neural network because we are actually more working the hardware side. But, but remember that for your, let's say, your mobile phone, for your computers, have a lot of mode, right? Meaning you could have a low power mode, high power mode, a uh, high performance mode, or if your battery is running, 
uh, running out. So probably you could actually you will actually allocate less resources to your uh, to your deep neural network computation. But if that is the case, if you want to still maintain the latency, what do you should do? You probably need to load another model, or if that is the case, you need to train a lot of model, right? So a nature solution is can we actually make this neural network to be a dynamic, meaning when I train one network, so this network consists of a lot of a subnet. And the smaller subnet is a subset of a relatively larger subset, uh, subnet. So now you can construct a dynamic neural network and the number of convolution cores get involved into the computation can be adjustable on the fly, right? On the fly, meaning based on your computing resources and your latency requirements, you could easily tune the number of kernels getting involved. Uh, of course, you need to probably sacrifice a little bit of accuracy if you only select uh, less important, uh, if you only select the most important kernels. So the accuracy will reduce a little bit, but your performance will increase a lot. So that's the main idea of the dynamic neural network. So we actually developed that. I mean, there are a few different methods we developed. Uh, I'll, I'll just give the details. I mean, I, I don't have too much time. The direct to shoot the results. Uh, so, for example, we actually validate the whole, you know, dynamic neural network into the CPU and the GPU, and we actually run the software. Uh, so, when the model is actually doing the inference on the fly, we could see that uh, you can actually on the fly to tune the latency, like very large range, right? For example, from 30 millisecond to 70 millisecond, uh, you know, it can tune that uh, on the fly without loading a new weight, and this is like, um, a dynamic neural network on the fly, right? So that's another work we have done. So let me skip this fast and efficient on device continue learning. Um, you know, uh, go to the mini the hardware side. I don't want to spend too much time when talk about that. Um, okay. So now is the last part of my, my talk. Like I said in the beginning. Um, so most of the talk today will mainly focus on AI software, the algorithm, uh, but the last part is more about the hardware side. Uh, you know, we, besides this software, I mean, all of this, uh, you know, AI algorithm we actually have worked on is trying to make the neural network running security and also efficient in the real hardware. So we need to verify that in the hardware and also co-design the hardware to run the, um, you know, algorithm we actually developed. For example, we uh, first verified that in the FPGA, this is a very small uh, IoT FPGA, which only consume, you know, probably two to four watts. Uh, we actually um, compress the model using, you know, uh, our previous discussed uh, Turing model, uh, pruning model. So the whole YOLO is only converted into like uh, only 140 uh, kilobits. So this thing can be put into the on-chip cache of this uh, small MPJ, and it only consume average like 2.6 watt to process a 720p real-time uh, video. Um, you know that's quite uh, 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 interesting. You know this thing can actually works well uh, in the binary or even in the ternary uh, model. Uh, the other thing is, like I said, uh, one of the main bottleneck of the state of our computer is the volume is a memory wall issue right because you need to fetch a huge amount of model size into the main uh, in, from the main memory to your cache and that amount of energy consumption is almost two orders larger than the computing itself so the memory becomes a main issue and a significant amount of work of our group is we're working on the concept of in-memory computing so the concept of in-memory computing is like that. I mean, it has to go into two directions, like the bottom up and the top down. The bottom up means we need to find a proper memory candidates, right? There are many different memory candidates, uh, DRAM, uh, non-local memory, magnetic RAM, resistive RAM. They all could be potentially, you know, have a large volume to store uh, your deep neural network model. So how do you actually embed logic into that memory? Right into that memory. So, what kind of logic can be done uh, to implement your neural network? So, we have done you know uh, different works trying to design these circuits to uh, support different logic within the memory instead of you know you copy the whole data uh, from the memory to the logic unit, but we embed the logic unit in the memory. 
So that's the main idea. But uh, I mean, for example, in the magnetic RAM case, we actually developed uh, many different kind of circuits. But the main idea is for the magnetic random access memory, which is a digital memory, right? It's a digital memory. So all of the logic we design is a bitwise. It's a Boolean logic, like and logic or logic, but it's a vector or and logic or logic. Um, you know, so we have to, you know, convert the neural network algorithm, like I said earlier, into ternary, uh, into binary, so that can be better uh, compatible with the digital processing memory we actually developed. And we have some other works on the DRAM side, uh, meaning we could also modify the circuits of the DRAM, so the DRAM can also uh, support, you know, this bitwise, uh, you know, uh, instruction set. Uh, which are mainly and function, or function, x or function, or potentially adder, uh, but multiplayer is very difficult, right? So, like I said, I'll just give you a few high level uh, summary of what we have done in the hardware side, like to uh, implement the neural network we have developed. For example, on the left is a collaborative work with a Southwestern, uh, South uh, Eastern University. Uh, we actually using our ternary weight. Uh, ternary weight uh, uh, neural network in the voice recognition. They are have embedded, let's say, with a, a microphone or with some kind of smart speaker. Uh, it has to be very, very low power, and it can recognize the keywords. Uh, and we have fabricated these chips, uh, which is under review by VOSI Symposium uh, this year. Uh, it only consume like four microwatt, uh, four microwatt using our ternary weight uh, neural network. Another one is we're actually uh, developing an in-SRAM computing platform. Uh, like I said, uh, the model can also be stored in the memory, uh, but the in-SRAM computing or in DRAM computing, uh, they can only support bitwise. So we also need to deploy our, you know, turbo weight into this uh, uh, computing platform. The other hardware we have done is in the emerging post simul side, uh, non to memory based in memory computing platform. Uh, we have done quite a lot in the uh, magnetic RAM uh, side. Uh, developing the in-memory uh, logic to support the bitwise, you know, uh, logic so that can support the bitwise operation for your neural network. Uh, we also have the resistive RAM uh, here. In this case, this is a 2D MOS2 uh, kind of memory insert. It's collaborative with uh, uh, Dr. Tanya Roy at UCF. Uh, we have fabricated this uh, 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 2D uh, array uh, to actually uh, implement uh, relatively, you know, a crossbar. The other one we have worked is we are collaborating with uh, a Sony Polytech, uh, working on a half uh dioxide uh, RM array. Uh, we're actually tipping out our ternary uh, weight uh, neural network and also you know the other applications uh, into this resistive crossbar array, so that can directly processing the neural network in the memory. But all of this is like I said, uh, we can now directly deploy the floating point number operation into this kind of processing memory platform. We all need a lot of optimization from the software, from the algorithm to be able to run it in this kind of platform. So, okay, uh, to summarize this part, uh, model compression is very important, um, not just for the cloud computing, but most important for the edge computing, right? For the processing memory. There are a lot of ways for the model compression. Our way is not trying to get the maximum compression rate, but instead, uh, after the compression, after the optimization, this model could be actually executed uh, in the uh, particular, you know, processing memory hardware. There's a lot of things we explored. Uh, for example, this pruning based method, the runtime adaption, and also on device continuum learning. I don't have time to go through that, but, uh, you know, you're free. You're very welcome to discuss with me later if you're interested in the on device continuum learning. So, okay, uh, thanks so much. I know it's a, you know, quite long talk, but, uh, Hope you know you get the basic idea of the whole uh, research flow you know in our lab, right? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Deliang. So very impressive. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry about uh, it. Any it's questions from the audience? Pretty long. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we have one question. So actually two questions. So from one audience. Sure. So for the parameter, 
noise injection defense during the evaluation phase, if you add the Gaussian noise to activation or waste, does it make the defense fall into the category of the, the gradient masking or stochastic grades? Gradients? If yes, does it make the defense vulnerable to attack that use expectation over transformation to correctly compute the gradient? Yeah, that's a very good so question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the gradient optimization is pretty, uh, you know, well existing problem there. Um, we add the, uh, let's say we add this, uh, uh, trainable noise to the weight to the gradients. Um, it could be potentially gradient optimization, but we actually follow, you know, the Cardi and Wagner defined way to check. The strengths of the gradients, we tested their, uh, DP, uh, uh, DA. Uh, attack uh, that indeed can increase the robustness. Um, so the answer is yes. There's a, a slightly gradient ossification, but based on their theory, you know, if you even it's random, but if you call many many times, the attacker could still learn the pattern. Uh, so we are using that to verify and still uh, can improve the robustness. The potential explanation could be uh, this kind of trainable noise injection. We verify that even in the normal training, it looks like that's a very good way to regularize the model. Uh, it works as a regularizer to improve the accuracy. Uh, it's not just the robustness, but also if you add this kind of uh, uh, trainable noise into your normal um, training process, uh, that's a very good regularizer to make your model train, uh, you know, more efficiently or, uh, you know, to reach into a better optimization point in a high dimension optimization uh, problem. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's pretty much, you know, what we observe in all the experiments. Okay, and uh, the second question from the audience, do you need specialized software hardware to get real speed up when using the DNS with the tenderization weights? Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. So if, um, like I said, the whole motivation of that ternary or, you know, that uh, processing element to wise pruning or uh, dynamic is we have a real, real, I mean, need from the hardware side. The hardware I mean, I'm mainly talking about is uh, the processing memory platform we actually developed. Um, if you run it in our platform, you can see great improvement. Uh, but if you run it in a, uh, in a, in a general purpose computer, um, you need the modification of the CUDA library. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about because even you a quantize a model, if you don't have a very good lower level, uh, you know, CUDA library can support, let's say, 8-bit quantize a model. And just using the original instruction they provided in the software, you barely see any benefits. I mean, similar thing for the pruning. So it has to be, uh, you know, properly designed in the hardware instruction level, right? And then you could get the benefits. If you're directly running in the, let's say, TensorFlow PyTorch that platform without the support of the quantization or the pruning, you can you definitely cannot get huge improvement. At least not the theoretically uh, improvement as you analyze the, you know, uh, uh, theoretically. Does does that okay, answer your question? Is that a way? And uh, a question, actually three questions from one audience. So first, how do you define the efficiency? Second, all the attacks are simulated, how real it could be? And third, so when you talk about the adaptive, how the adaptive is achieved? Uh, first, uh, the efficiency. Uh, the efficiency, that's a very, very general concept. Um, so, but but in in a, in a real experiments, what we care about is uh, 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 the model size. Um, I mean, the real model size store into memory because we are talking about presenting memory. Uh, we have a very limited uh, memory size in the chip, so the model size has to be pretty small. Otherwise, you know, we cannot execute the whole model um, unless you have a very very big chip. So, so, so if it is important view, I mean, the model size is, important, is very important. And the other one is uh, uh, what kind of uh, instructions needed for your neural network computation. So it has to, that instruction has to be relatively simpler or supported by your hardware 
or you know very efficient uh, by your hardware. Uh, if you only require such kind of instructions, the overall uh, energy consumption will be lower. Uh, if your model size is smaller, you don't need to copy you know huge amount of data from optic you know to the processing unit. So that can also save the energy. So the efficiency all coming from uh, both the memory side and also the computing side. Uh, I forget the second question, but let me first talk about the third one is adaption. That's an interesting question. I mean, we actually received the question, you know, from all the other, how this uh, adaption, especially on the fly adaption can be done. Uh, that's a, that's a very, uh, you know, good question. So you can imagine in a way, like, instead of training a fixed network, right? Uh, because typically if you train a fixed network, if you just remove or randomly drop out some uh, kernel, you may uh, not get a good uh, accuracy, for example, just like our uh, beef flipper attack, you change some, you know, all of a sudden the network doesn't work. If you don't train it in a way. Uh, but what do we do is train a supernet. That supernet has many, many subnets. Let's say this supernet has 100 uh, subnets. Uh, it means it may have 100 combinations. Huh? Uh, the larger subnet is a superset of the smaller subnet. So it's like in a hierarchical way. So when you load the model, you could choose to execute any subnet, right? You could choose to execute any subnet. So on the fly means if the model is already in the main memory, and in this time point, I just want to execute the subnet one, then I just fetch subnet one. Uh, the other one is, you know, if you want to execute subnet two, you just fetch subnet two. That's what we talk about in the subnet. Even in the cache, I mean, if you decide I don't want to execute this amount of uh, 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 kernels, you can also abandon that because they are in a hierarchical way. You always load the most important ones first to execute that. And the rest of them, I mean, depend on you to execute or not. But the, you can still get the correct function. I'm not sure if that is clear, but that's exactly what we do uh, in, the, in the evaluation. Uh, what is the second question? What do you remember? Uh, the second question is, oh, uh, are all the attacks simulated? So how real it could be? Oh, all of the attack is valid in a real real computer. Uh, for example, the first one for the BitFlip, uh, I, I have shown you know, what DRAM we're using, right? We attack a few different DRAMs. It's a unique security, so they only affect, you know, you have a real person tab. It's not a simulation. So every attack we're talking about is, uh, uh, we actually married that in a real computer. So we actually actually flip the bits in your main memory. Um, so that's all based on, you know, real experiments. The second FPG is also based on real experiments. Uh, the main difference for the uh, memory side and also the data communication attack is, uh, for the memory side, we're assuming a white box. So we know all of the weight parameter, but for the FPG one, uh, the searching takes much, much longer time, but it's a black box. We don't know what is exactly running in the FPG, but we are attacking the data communication. But that's also verified in a real, uh, you know, cloud FPG setup. Okay, and uh, another question is about on-device learning. I think that is what do you skip that part? So. The audience ask a faster training process is required for on device learning. So, what if we could have a binary value update in our gradient instead of the updating the floating numbers? Um, that's a good question. Um, for the on device learning, uh, our point we're not doing the turnering on on device learning. That, that's a good question. Is um, the on-device learning from our side, uh, we believe, I mean, if you want to train it from scratch, for example, you just want to construct a model uh, for image that, it's not practical to do on-device learning, for example, using a mobile phone or using, you know, this uh, tiny GPU to do a real training from scratch. Um, that's not practical. The on-device learning we are talking about is on-device continual learning, meaning you already have a backbone model. Uh, it's running, let's say, in your mobile phone. It's, a, it's already running in a, in a small IoT device. But yes. now you get new data coming in, right? You want to continually learn uh, the model. 
So that's the case when the continued learning uh, or on device continuous learning will work. But for our case, uh, we are using the binary alternative cases. We actually have a mask based training, which is a binary mask based training uh, that can keep the backbone model unchanged. We only train the binary mask, and then that can, uh, you know, that can um, continue to learn new tasks. That's the main idea we're using. So, to summarize, we are not talking about on device training from scratch, but on device continue learning. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I answer your question, but that's what we do. I mean, if you are interested, you can check this paper. Uh, this paper is what we uh, just accepted by this year's UPR. We actually uh, run all the experiments in the, uh, in the uh, Jettison, Jettison Nano. So all of the continued learning is actually deployed into the Jettison Nano. Um, and we report it, I mean, instead of, you know, very powerful, let's say, China or, or P, uh, 200, 2000, you know, this kind of uh, powerful GPU, but we are all of experiments is done on the Jet2 Nano. Uh, we could reach it to, you know, uh, similar performance or uh, but similar time compared with the larger ones. So that, that's the main thing, you know, we are talking about on device uh, continuum learning. Okay. And uh, so one last question. So you talk about many flipping bit attack. My naive question is that, is there any way to test the integrity of the original model, like a footprint from the encryption? Yeah, yeah, definitely you could, but think about how much price you need to pay. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Intel has this SGX, which is a secure executing environment. I do all the data integrity check, uh, data encryption, you know, everything. But if you look at the performance, that's probably three orders, uh, three orders or two orders, um, you know, uh, more complexity. Uh, because remember that you have a few hundreds of megabytes of data, uh, and we only change like 10 bits. Even you are using, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, th uh, you know, this ECC, even you're using ECC, uh, in some cases we test it, you probably cannot detect. Um, and we are talking about like real time machine learning, right? A lot of cases you are doing the real time machine learning, and you need to very very frequently load your model from the main memory to your cache. If you do the data integrity for every uh, cycle, um, that's not practical. Uh, of course, you can. Uh, in the extreme case, if you want absolutely secure, definitely. So it's also a trade off, right? Uh, but is that a practical trade off? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so so thank you again. Thank you, Deliang, for give us a very exciting and very in comprehensive, impressive talk. So so this is the end of our this week's uh, efficient AI seminar talk. So next week it will be our uh, spring break. So our talk will be the next uh, next next Tuesday, so March twenty twenty three. So again, the um. Elian, thank you very much for your exciting talk. All right, thank you everyone for attending this talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Very nice to talk with you guys. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.